All right, good afternoon everyone, great to be here. I like that tagline, 5G the lifesaver. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to start using that from now on. Excellent idea. Um, great pleasure to be here today and talk a little bit about, um, do I have a clicker by the way? Uh, yeah. mm, somewhere, oh here it is. Um, to talk a little bit about um, Spectrum, my favorite topic uh, for 5G and in general, and it's a fascinating topic because on one hand, it's such an intangible item, you know, you can't really see it, you can't really feel it, but it's damn expensive. I mean, last year we participated in an auction and paid $8 billion for a you know, chunk of spectrum in, in low band. So like, which one is it? Uh, but it is something that kind of our networks uh, live and breathe on and without it, we couldn't operate. It's the lifeline of our industry. It's really what makes wireless work. And, and for that, I think it's a great topic to discuss in the context of 5G. You could also view it from a standpoint that why do we need to talk about spectrum so much? I mean, we already have it, so why not use what's in place today? But if you look back, every new generation has been enabled by new, clean, unused spectrum. And that's because refarming is hard. It's easier to deploy a new technology on spectrum that you can immediately allocate for it rather than you know, try to take it away from something else that's already using it. Um, I want to start by kind of talking a little bit about 5G, and it's definitely a very versatile and broad uh, technology. It's not just one thing like speed or one use case like fixed wireless access. It's about many things. It's about building on what's in place today, you know, improving the services that we depend on today, and we've kind of grown accustomed to using on a daily basis, while at the same time introducing new services and new capabilities and even expanding the scope of wireless technologies into areas that are maybe not available to us today. Maybe because those new industries, they may have specific requirements in terms of latency or reliability or maybe some other aspects that are hard to accommodate and, and, and meet with today's technologies. And that's the beauty of 5G, that it can do so many things uh, for us. And if you look at this arc of different use case examples, yes, you know, fixed wireless access is definitely part of 5G as well. But the lion's share of the use cases revolve around mobility. And mobility and kind of a mobile aspect of those services are definitely going to be a key in the 5G world as well. And if you kind of look at some of these use cases, it's really about mobile broadband and making it better. You know, smartphones that are faster and smarter, you know, maybe more high definition mobile video, and even new services like mobile augmented reality, mobile virtual reality, you know, immersive media, those sort of things. But you also have to think beyond smartphones to you know, connected objects of all kinds. Uh, sensors with years long battery life that can connect everything that you know, can and should be connected basically everywhere. Or smart city applications that create a bridge between us, the users of that infrastructure, and the infrastructure itself creating efficiencies that maybe are not possible uh, today. And even different tra tracking applications because surprise, surprise, a lot of these IoT applications, they do move around. I use this example a lot. When my kids were a little younger, they, especially one of them, kept on losing a jacket every week, and it drove me crazy, and it cost me an arm and a leg. It was a lot of money that I spent on buying jackets to that guy. If I had a 5G-enabled jacket with some sort of a sensor in it that would let me know where the jacket is, you know, when my kid loses it, you know, I would be willing to pay a little bit of money for that. So there's a lot of value add in simple services. It doesn't all have to be extremely rich in nature. Simple services that help us, you know, create value in our day-to-day -day lives. To enable 5G, you need two things. You need infrastructure, and I don't mean just base stations and devices, but I mean real estate where to deploy 5G. But I'm not here to talk about that today. I, well, I guess it suffice to say that there are, there's room for improvement. You know, great steps have been taken, and you know, the recent uh, uh, streamlining efforts that FCC, for example, has um, made or changed here in the US, definitely helpful, but we look for continued uh, progress in that space. But the second piece, the equally important, maybe even more important piece, is spectrum. As a young RF engineer, the first thing that I learned was you know, no signal, no service, and you need spectrum to send that signal, and that's why it's such an important uh, piece of 5G. But before I go into that spectrum aspects of 5G, I want to talk about the third component, which is not necessarily an enabler, but you have to have a foundation on which to build your 5G network on. And that foundation is really LTE. And 
there's so much talk about 5G going on today that it's easy to think that this is just another generational change, just like you know, when you went from 2G to 3G or 3G to 4G, the next generation came in to replace and displace the previous generation. With 5G, that's not the case. It's the first time in the history of wireless we actually have an ability to combine two generations together. You know, Ron in his previous presentation or keynote talked about this uh, 3GPP acronym of ENDC, but that's what he meant uh, by that, if you're not familiar with what it means, and it's really about dual connectivity, meaning we can aggregate 4G and 5G together. Yes, my device today, it does support 2G and 3G and 4G, but I can only connect to one of those technologies at a time. In the 5G world, my device can connect to both 5G and 4G at the same time, combining the best of both worlds. And I think that's really key. So you have to have a great foundation in place so that you can build your 5G on it and provide the best of both worlds. And as a representative of T-Mobile, that's something that I'm really proud of. That's something that sets us apart, is this LTE leadership. We have the fastest and most advanced network in the nation. For the last 17 quarters in a row, in fact, we've had the fastest network in the US. And that is tremendous. And how we get there is by relentlessly driving LTE evolution forward, by deploying all the meaningful you know, LTE advanced features, you know, the ones that we are also familiar with, like 256 QAM or 4x4 MIMO, carrier aggregation. We did all those things first so that we get closer to this gigabit class service in LTE as well. But we've also deployed every other meaningful LTE advanced feature, the latest one being, for example, narrowband IoT that will be available nationwide you know, this summer. We also have a very advanced Volti network. All of our network is Volti capable. And today, more than 80%, that's 8-0, almost every call that's made in the network is a Volti call. And that, again, you know, is an evidence how you drive LTE evolution further. But technology in itself is not enough. You also have to have coverage in place. And we've painted this magenta map that you can see on the other side of the slide that's really where the service is available today. And if I look kind of statistics available from crowdsourced information, in our network, our customers get access to LTE network more often than in other network uh, in, in the country. And today we cover 322 million Americans and our stated goal by end of this year is to re, uh, increase that number to 325 million, which is quite tremendous. But this foundation is important, and I just want to emphasize this, that I know, you know 5G is a great topic and we want to talk about it a lot, but let's not forget that LTE is going to play an important part in that 5G future too. And the ability to combine the two together provides tremendous value. So let's talk a little bit about spectrum. And we've talked about you know, this multiband strategy for 5G from a spectrum standpoint being an important part of that. And that's absolutely true. To be able to enable or, or, or meet the vision of 5G and all these you know, different use cases, some requiring high speed, some requiring low speed, some requiring low latency, some not caring about latency, some being localized in nature, not really moving around, some moving around having a requirement for coverage nationwide. And for that, you have to have spectrum across all these different bands. You need low band spectrum for nationwide coverage and, and, and coverage reliability. Because that's simple physics. The lower the frequency, the further it propagates, the better it penetrates uh, you know, walls and, and objects. And a lot of these devices, especially if you think about IoT space, are going to be deployed in hard to reach ba uh, you know, places. Maybe basements or some other locations like that that are hard to reach with, with other frequency bands. And low band has that great capability of getting into those places so that we can connect everything regardless of where it's deployed. You also need mid-band spectrum for consistent uh, capacity and speed experience. And this is important for many mobile broadband applications. And if I look at what I'm using, for example, my smartphone for today, lion's share, almost all the applications that I use today will not really benefit from gigabit speeds, but it will benefit from you know, tens of megabits per second, so maybe 100 megabit per second or something like that. But when I get to these extremely high speeds, it doesn't necessarily translate into immediate value. But that mid-band spectrum is very important to provide good, consistent capacity and speed experience across border, uh, broader geography. And then finally, 
you need millimeter wave spectrum as well so that you can reach those ultra high speeds that we often associate you know, 5G with the gigabit speed, so tens of gigabits per second on a localized basis. And unfortunately, you know, although this spectrum, because there's a lot of it, has a great potential of providing that, it doesn't propagate far. And that's why I think it's really best suited for dense urban areas, you know, venues, traffic hotspots, or localized applications like maybe some industry verticals, manufacturing plants, stuff like that. But none of these bands in itself is the answer to 5G. You have to have spectrum across all these different bands to be able to address 5G in its full glory. In the US, I think we've done a good job, and when I say we, I mean the industry in general, in bringing low band uh, to the market for 5G. We are also going to have auctions in the not so distant future. First one, I think, scheduled for later on this year to on 28 gigs in the millimeter wave space. But I think there's room for improvement in terms of finding more mid-band spectrum for 5G in the US. And a lot of the earlier presentations today were talking about, you know, three and a half gig spectrum and how that's important. Many countries kind of prioritizing that for 5G. And I wish in the US we were kind of in the same place where we had a, a clear line of sight for bringing a significant amount of uh, three and a half gig spectrum uh, for 5G in the US. But we're working on it. And as T-Mobile, we've been advocating hard, you know, working with FCC and other industry stakeholders to make that happen. So I'm hopeful and optimistic that we will get there. I think finally what I want to just talk a little bit about is our plans for 5G, kind of what are we do, doing about it. And we definitely are going to build a 5G network, like as I said, builds on, on LTE. And we're going to do it initially on the 600 megahertz band as well as on the millimeter wave band. So the 600 megahertz spectrum that we won in an auction last year that I already talked about will be initially deployed uh, for LTE. But as we deploy it, we will de deploy it with 5G-ready hardware. And then when 5G becomes available next year in terms of devices being available and kind of the ecosystem starting to mature, we can just upgrade those sites with software only to support 5G. Today, and again, we less, we, we like less than a year away from getting access to those licenses, we've deployed 600 in many places. In fact, over 800, it's live in over 800 cities and towns in the US across 31 states. And that's pretty significant how quickly we've gotten to that point, because this, obviously it has to be cleared and it has to be deployed. Those kind of things usually take time. And then we have millimeter wave spectrum in where it makes sense, you know, many big markets. And we're going to deploy that too, especially in kind of a downtown densest areas to see how we can augment and build additional capability on top of that. And then, as I mentioned, we do everything we can to bring additional mid-band spectrum uh, 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 to the market so that we can build this three-tier layer that I talked about on my previous slide. And with that, I just want to summarize that, you know, spectrum is an integral part of 5G. We shouldn't take it for granted. You definitely need new spectrum because that's the great enabler for any technology change. And you need it across different bands. And I think that's a key difference relative to previous generations that because of that versatility and richness of 5G in terms of use cases that it can, it can address, one band in itself is not going to do it. You need spectrum across all different bands. I think I have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to stop here and, and leave that for questions. Thank you. Okay, do we have some questions? Right there in the back. Hello, uh, would you comment a little bit about your unlicensed spectrum vision? Yes, unlicensed spectrum. Thank you for bringing that up. So unlicensed spectrum is an Im important uh, aspect, too, of 5G. All, of course, you know, licensed spectrum is something that kind of builds the backbone of both LTE and 5G. But we've already taken steps to utilize unlicensed spectrum in the LTE space. And we've seen great benefits in that. Uh, LAA, or LTE over unlicensed, works really, really well. And the 5 gig band that's being used for it is pretty underutilized, especially in outdoor environments. Uh, I think it was PCMag that wrote an article about a month ago. We have already some sites up and running on Manhattan in New York. So if you are in New York or from New York, go and check it out. It's on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 45th Street. Uh, and they clocked more than 500 megabit per second in the testing that they did in the heart of Manhattan. And that just shows how there's great potential in unlicensed to augment and supplement what we do with license spectrum. And I think that same will apply in the 5G world as well. The other piece of that is that, of course, you know, there's a 14 gigahertz of spectrum in the 60, 70 gig range that's unlicensed that will be applicable in 5G. 
and there are many use cases for it. It could potentially be used in access, it could potentially be used for backhauling, or it could potentially be used maybe even for something else as well. And those are the kind of use cases that we're looking at. 3GPP is just in release 16 starting to look at the unlicensed aspects of 5G, but I think it's an important part of 5G and an important part of the spectrum story for 5G, just like it is in the LTE world. Another question right here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Yi Kang uh, from MediaTek, where uh, Taiwan is a uh, chipset company. Uh, just uh, curious, uh, you mentioned uh, the new spectrum from millimeter wave or also the mid, uh, mid band spectrum. I think maybe uh, based on your presentation, there may be objectives are different, maybe one for the capacity and one for coverage. I just wonder from your perspective, uh, which, uh, which one uh, is more critical uh, from, from your, your 5G deployment uh, strategy perspective? I think they are all critical. But it also depends on use cases. You know, some use cases may utilize a specific spectrum band more so than other ones. Uh, and it's important that you have network controls for that. For example, a lot of the IoT applications, especially the ones that don't uh, require a lot of throughput, I could see them being best served by low band. And then all the broadband applications that require maybe higher throughput and as well as some mobility, that could be a combination of mid-band and millimeter wave. But this is not a binary, you know, yes, no, this, that type of an answer. All of these things play a role in, in the 5G world, and they're all equally important if your goal is to meet the 5G vision in its fullest. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up there, Corey. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>